So we're going to call into order the select board meeting on October 26th, 6 p.m. Uh, and we are on a conference line, and people can call in 413-369-1541 uh, if you probably already have called in. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to approve the minutes from last week's meeting. Two weeks ago. Two, two weeks ago, the last meeting. Have we have we gotten a pamphlet for each of us for with the contains stuff that we usually include the minutes? Yeah, it's in the box. It's in where? Oh. Distribute those. That would be great. Thank you, sorry. Oh, I, <laughs> Theoretically, you're in charge of the box. Maybe oh, yeah. I didn't tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I have it on my phone, but always the last thing Sure, that's the way it's, it'll be for a while. came in the mail, but now we can look at them and we remember them. Yeah. yeah. So the minutes seem okay? Yeah. To approve the minutes. So uh, do I hear a second? Yes. Good. Okay. So all in favor, we all agree. Great. Uh, we have three warrants. We have a vendor warrant for 516,238.73. dollars a payroll warrant for 108,287 and 4 cents and we have a payroll deduction warrant for 27,023 and 85 cents so we have a motion to approve them yeah they they all look fine it's always since Kristen's listening and in i can just it's always a pleasure to see the same school committee warrants come from twice i get to see them in the school committee <laughs> Then I get to see them come across this time too. It's always How lucky you are. Yes, yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> oh, good. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, do I have a second? Second. Yes. Okay, we all vote aye. Aye. Uh, so, meetings attended by select board members. So, Erica, how about you? Not me. No. Uh, Phil, you always have many. Um, we had a frontier meeting. And then I had a, a, a Conway Grammar School meeting that I had to miss because I had the, uh, my counselor meeting for the fr Frontier uh, Franklin Regional Council of Government, the counselor's meeting was at the same time. Um, uh, but, uh, and then we had the, the, um, the after action uh, meeting for the, from the storm followed by a few days later a meeting with the Verizon representative to explain in particular Verizon's numerous shortcomings. Um, Did they agree to any of them or apologize? Uh, you know, they could have done more, but they didn't have to have done more, but the chaos of the situation and the da 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 But, um, you know, our, our, our police chief made accurate note that what they eventually did with tying the, 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 the you know, we that road was closed. The state highway through the middle of town was closed for 60 hours, and you know, at the end of it, they did what they could have done at the beginning of it, and um, yeah. yeah, and um, so yeah. But we did we did get valuable f phone. Uh, the, the 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 best thing that we got out of it was the phone number of the person that we really need to call when you can't get them to do anything that you want them to do and that they're legally obligated to do. Um, <laughs> yes, so that was good. The, our, our, our town EMS Rolodex has been substantially upgraded as a result of this weather event, which should serve us well in the future. Um, yeah, so that's, a, that, that's my report. 
So I had two, we had a conservation commission meeting and we had another meeting with Comcast. We are still, remember we, we objected to Comcast's offer. We've got, I think, two more offers since then. We're still waiting for them to accept or reject our latest offer. So we always ex assume they are going to accept. Yes? Has entered the conference. Has entered the conference. Who's that? We always expect them to accept the offer that we offered them last. But as you know, Phil, it never Keep offering. Okay. Public comments. So does anybody in the public out there have a comment? And really a comment unrelated to the things on our agenda. Because we'll get to those. I guess not. Um, we have no old business. This is amazing to have no old business, but we have lots of new business. So our first order of new business is for approving the grammar school playground design. And I assume, Kristen, you're going to tell us about that. Yeah, Shelly, you're right too, right? Uh, Shelly, I'm And Shelly too, yeah? Can you make that louder? Yeah, I'm here. Did, I, did everyone receive a copy of the... Um, the um, contract yes. uh, submitted by Berkshire Design Group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So this is, of course, for surveying and analyzing the site, developing the playground master plan, uh, bidding service, and construction observation for the play area. Um, Carl, the person that we're working with, said that the timing is just really perfect in terms of moving this forward and then looking for vendors, um, you know, in January, February, really starting the project. Um, Shelly, did you want to add any more to that? No, well, I think that was a, a good summary. What they'll do in the winter months is start the bidding process for the project and they'll still handle all of the um, procurement, making sure that we're following state procurement laws and put things out to bid for us for not just um, services, but also products uh, for the playground equipment. So can I ask a question? Yeah. What is the scope of this? I mean, the existing playground equipment that like, it was probably maybe 10 years ago, like a whole team of parents like, you know, spent a week <laughs> putting that in. Is that going to be replaced, or are we just talking about replacing um, like the blacktop underneath the um, basketball hoops and the swings? And what exactly is the scope of the of the uh, remediation? So did you hear that, Kristen? Yes. Yeah, I did. So great question. So the the big structure that the community put together and the parents that they we have a lot of. Um, we have a lot of ADI, the ADA compliance issues, and um, our fall zones all over the playground just need to be redone. So there's going to be a lot of work on the surface areas. And then, um, so it's, it's the majority of that is going to go to surface areas, you know, like you said, the basketball court, but also underneath, we don't have a thick enough um, fall zone by the swings. And, the swings are um, not in the going in the right direction, and then the pre-K area is just a complete mess. Um, we up until recently had a uh, stairs leading to a slide that didn't exist, and um, so we need some more development to the appropriate materials in that area. Also, some of the inclines are going to take a look at some of the inclines in terms of wheelchair accessibility. We don't have any equipment that. ADA compliant or um, available for any students who have physical disabilities. So, uh, you know what, I can send you the original um, the original uh, proposal that you might not have seen that was we looked at with the um, committee in terms of approval during the town meeting. So I can send that to you that will talk more about that as well. Janet Shade. Hi, Janet. No, that's fine, Kristen. I, 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 I mean, the conference. Um, I, that was before I was on select board, so I'm sh that, like I can get that yeah. information. <laughs> I, I was just I was just asking out of yeah curiosity, and, but, but thank you very much, Kristen. This is Philip. Just just, yeah. just so that people um, 
can understand the where, where this this is the project that was voted on and approved by town at town meeting um, out of CPA funds in the amount of two hundred and fifty thousand total, I believe. Uh, Correct. Yeah, and so and, and the the scope of the work was all part of that. Um, what was that? And I you know I I know that there's an additional component for ADA compliance and the Germain Fund. And I was trying to go through the minutes of previous select board meetings, because I know the select board previously did vote unanimously to um, open up the Germain Fund for, for that purpose. And I think... Um, Was that for the, for the ball field? No, it, it's for the, it's to make, it's to do the handicapped accessibility right, stuff. But, but, but originally, I think we spent Germain money on the ball field? Yeah, but when we looked at the Germain, at the actual language of the Germain fund, it was, it actually mentioned playground stuff, and it, it, it was, it's really what the, what it was all about. Um, yeah. But, so, so, I think that's just, once you have the numbers for that, that that's just filling out an application, uh, about what you're asking for, and then we get to vote on the exact numbers. I believe that's the way that sets up. But um, so we just wait. So we need to move to approve the contract. So I get my, my last question. Um, I guess Kristen and, and Shelley is is might Berkshire Design Group be bidding on the contract that Berkshire Design Group is administering or um, doing the design for? Might, might they be bidding on the work itself? Uh, I didn't get that impression. Kristen, I'm not sure if you did, but it sounded like they would be putting it out for bid for the um, construction work and installation, that they would just be doing the design. Okay. Yeah, that would be a, yeah. a conflict I, of interest. I, I wonder. Out. I wonder, because I was kind of hoping that they'd be around to do the work. <laughs> this kind of rules them out from doing the work. Um, so my understanding is, yeah, they, they would get the get it started and then possibly oversee some of it throughout. But in terms right. of contractors and, and um, you know um, any playground equipment that we might have add, that that would all be different vendors and different construction yeah. folks other than them. And what was the amount of this contract? <sighs> this contract was. I thought it was. Should be in there. I thought it was in here, but I'm just not seeing it. But it probably is. Sorry, I'm too I, I, fast, yeah, I thought it was mentioned in the attorney's note. Uh, so the design contract is twenty thousand dollars. That's my bear. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That, that, did you see it in here? I just no. That that number strikes rings a bell. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was expecting. Yeah. But I, yeah, it's a big fee contract um, at $20,000, and if there is any additional work needed for design beyond that, they won't move forward without providing us additional documentation with quotes, and then we would decide if, if we needed to add those additional things. But it includes, um, there's different phases, so there's uh, site analysis is the first phase, then we have uh, creating the final master plan. Then they move on to creating construction and bid documents. And then in the final task is the bidding and construction operation. So it's a total of $20,000. And you might not see that because that's pushed on to the sort of awkwardly on the fourth page, the total fee. It's in a place where you might not see. And Eric, have you did you go past the contract? We, we don't no, see a fourth page. I don't see a fourth page, and that's what's wrong then. Okay, it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's here somewhere. And also, attached to that, just so Eric can just take a look, is is really the scope of the, of the project and about, you know, about the services and things like that. Who should I send that to, Phil, so that this can be given to all of the members? You, you can send it to Tom. Just an email is fine. Okay. Yeah. Tom, I think you, you have this from um, the contract that includes seven pages actually, includes the scope of the project in this. Um, what I have is, is what I gave them, I believe. If you could if you could send what, what you were just describing, that would be great. Sure. That was just the sure. first three pages, I'll send that I think. To you now. Okay, I'll send that to you now, Tom. 
Great. Oh. Okay. Any other issues? <laughs> the, the, no. Actually, I'm looking at, at, at Kristen. It was part of your principal's report for the last school committee meeting. <laughs> the letter that you're looking for right now. Yes. So you can send it to us, though. So. Can. Thank you. Okay. So, do we have a motion to accept this contract? Uh, I uh, move to accept the contract. Agreement between yeah. Conway and the Berkshire Design Group. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do we second. have a second? Yes. So, all in favor? Yes. Aye. Great. Um, it looks like this is a contract that just I sign, or do we all, do you, you want to sign it? You're fine. So it's okay with me, whatever. It's just but a spot for you. It has a spot for me, so. All right, go for it. Um, do you want me to sign this one that I have, Tom, or? There should be one in the, uh, in the to be signed folder. There is. Thank you very much, everybody. Oh, thank yeah. you. And uh, no, no, not that the correction matters that much, but the, the letter that I, I just uh, pulled up, the, the, the total sco uh, fixed fee amount for the scope of service for the design work is 19000 Oh, Berkshire Designs some additional money to use a business platform. So they actually updated that bill. Okay. Um, and I the most recent one that we sent to Tom was 20000 Yeah, actually, sorry for that whole detour. That was pointless. Sorry. Okay. 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 Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great night. Thanks. Yes. Always. She she Shelly, before you go, there's something else that you have. Maybe we can skip that to the front of the line so she we can deal with Shelly. Which one? The, the sub grantee agreement. Yeah, and uh, you should be able to. You should be able to approve that tonight. Was that that's was that, that this one? Yeah. The COVID yeah. relief money. Do you want to yeah. talk about that, Shelly? What that is? Sure. So um, with the municipal COVID oh, yeah. relief act, uh, towns are able to sub grant funds of their municipal funding for coronavirus relief to other organizations such as regional school districts. Um, another uh, regional school had put this agreement together for their school committee. Um, and Tom and I have both taken a look at it and we have put it together for all four towns for Frontier Regional. So the agreement that you see there, it's not a required document. The final page that is a certification that's signed by Darius Modesto, our superintendent, is required. It's just a certification stating this is the amount that um, we've requested and that what we're buying falls within the guidelines of the grant that the town has received and that we're a sub-grantee. The first few pages of that is something that after seeing what another community has done, we felt would um, provide some protection for Frontier and for the town in particular in an agreement as to what we were being granted funds from. So of course, you know, the state has to approve Conway's request and <coughs> Conway has to be to grant Frontier their portion. So what I sent over to Tom today in that agreement is just the Conway portion of Frontier's expenditures related to coronavirus relief. Uh, so this, what we have is labeled uh, one through four of five, but no page five. Was that the attachment, the, the certification? Yeah, so page, well, you should have the certification. What I have That would have been I was not in the office. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, great. You have it, the attachment A or um, appendix A. Not that I see. Um, let me see. Let me pull it up. I'm just going to pull up the document. So 
So page five was actually a blank page because I had to have Darius sign this electronic particular Adobe sign. So page five was just a confirmation oh. that he had particular Adobe. So I pulled that out and I scanned it to Tom. So the um, attachment A is page four. <coughs> page four, uh -huh. correct. That's, that's the page that um, a and at the state is requiring that we send. Um, and you'll see the dollar amount there in number one it, for Conway's portion is just over 17,000. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, the, like I said, the first three pages, that actually is not required by the state, but it is something that we feel would make both the town and the, the district feel more comfortable with the exchange of funds. And basically just states that um, Conway will reimburse Frontier, so Frontier is paying for those expenditures. We've outlined the four categories, cleaning supplies, PPE, social distancing materials, and then distance learning equipment. Um, those are the four categories of the grant. We've outlined the different spending amounts there. Um, and then there's also a statement in here, I believe, I don't want to speak wrong. I thought I had added it. Um, in part one, um, this sentence actually was not in the agreement that we received from another district, but I added this in uh, just again for some more security so that if the state rejects um, any of our expenditures and they're not qualified as eligible expenses, Frontier would have to pay back to the town. Um, for those expenses. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone understood that we would do that if something did not qualify. Although we do think that all of our purchases will qualify. So, great. So, so Sally, this is Philip again. Um, so the, um, uh, the, so ha ha the town of Conway has already exhausted its previous CARES fund balance. Is that right? Um, no. I believe there no. was some portion for Frontier that was approved originally and for Conway Grammar School that was approved originally for Chromebook that we haven't received yet. So I would imagine that Tom still is holding those funds from the original request that we put in. Yes, we have received no funds and we are we are not we have not reached our limit. Uh, there is a third round that will occur in December, uh, which is kind of a cleanup round. Um, but even with that, I doubt we'll, we'll uh, exceed our allotment. Okay, so, so we have substantial room under, we have substantial, is it six Oh, we're, we're fine for this round. Okay. 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 So I bet the, the request for 17,000 seems pretty modest and... Uh, so this is just for the grammar school, this is for Frontier, right? I thought this was well, I thought, this, Frontier. Is, is that the total for everything? Um, no, we're so doing this, this with Frontier. This so agreement Frontier is with Frontier. Is yeah, you don't have to have a separate agreement with the grammar school because the grammar school already falls under the town's funding. Joe Sutton, Hi, Joe. Hello. Welcome to the conference. Um, okay. You don't have to do the sub grant piece that you do with a regional school district because Frontier is a separate entity. That's why we're doing this. Frontier is not eligible for this type of funding through the state. Frontier did get um, some different coronavirus relief funding, but this particular grant that the state was offering municipalities, regional school districts are not eligible for, which is why towns are able to sub-grant funds to regional school districts. Um, but Conway's portion is not included, or Conway Grammar School, um, funds are not included here. Tom has those in a separate email request that I sent over. Perfect. So we're good? That's awesome. I think so. Yeah. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you. So You're welcome. Um, make a motion that we that we uh, agree to this uh, sub grantee agreement for Corona Relief Fund. I second that. And, and sign the agreement where indicated. So I'm going to sign it and I'll pass it down. Excellent.
Thank you so much, all. I know the town has their being expenses and they have to make sure are covered as well. But Frontier very much appreciates everything that you're doing to support them. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, Shelly. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye bye. So, Patricia, are you here to do uh, making Conway an age friendly community? Uh, we're not expecting Patricia, but is Noor on the phone? Noor Strout? Yes, I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, please. Uh, go ahead and uh, please present the uh, age friendly community concept. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me today with you. I'll try to keep this brief to respect your time, but I just wanted to take a few minutes to say a little bit about the Age Friendly Communities Program, why it is important right now, what the pro program itself is, and what are our next steps and what we, uh, what the community participation that we're looking for. So first of all, the community, the Age Friendly Communities Program was started by the World Health Organization about 13 years ago to respond to a lot of the demographic trends that we have right now. Basically, our population is looking very different from what it used to, to, to be like because of uh, modern medicine and public health, life spans are longer, uh, and, and so the population looks much more aged than it used to be. Um, and one of the stats I found out interesting is by 2034, there will be more people age 65 and over in the U.S. than people under the age of 18. Um, and that trend has already actually has already happened in Franklin County. We have 22 percent of the population is over 65 compared to 18 under 18. So it's important for us to be aware of this population change and find ways to respond to it and to respond to the needs of this population that's different. Um, and so that's where the age friendly community of this movement comes in. Like I said, this movement was initiated by World Health Organization and it is administered in the U.S. by AARP. And the program targets long-term and policy level change um, and works, it, it has four phases uh, and, and the program takes about three to five years. And so the four major phases are enrollment, which is where we are right now trying to uh, uh, get the towns in our area enrolled in the network. Uh, that takes as an application and there's a letter from select board that goes into the enrollment. And the enrollment is really just a commitment from the community that we are aware of this program that we want to be more age friendly. Um, and so it's the first step. And then we go to the second step is needs assessment, where we take a comprehensive look at the needs of all people in the communities, uh, what works for them, what doesn't work for them. And then the third phase is planning, coming up with action plans that can respond to those findings. And moving into the fourth one, which is implementation. Um, and really, after implementation, the concept here is that uh, it, it, it never ends, and there's always a reassessment and replanning and re-improving our community. Uh, and ARP and the World Health Organization have been, they identified eight domains to help communities focus on different uh, different fields and what, how they can help the, the older adults. These eight domains are three are in built environments, like transportation, housing, and the, the other ones are social environment domains, like respect and social inclusion, um, social participation, uh, civic participation and employment, for example. And what's really cool about this framework is that ARP and the World Health Organization are uh, uh, encouraging towns to select what they want to work on. It's flexible, no one has to do everything. Um, you can mix domains together or do it whichever way, way works for the community. Uh, we will also look into uh, integrate dementia friendly work in this, in this uh, project. And so dementia friendly communities are in communities that are informed and safe for people who are living with dementia and their caregivers. They actually started as a separate movement and there's a separate organization that started it, which is called Dementia Friendly America, but they worked with ARP to encourage towns and programs to do both of these uh, together in the beginning because they have a lot in common. Uh, I, I wanted to give you an idea about age-friendly communities around us. In, across the U.S., there are over 470 communities that have joined the network, um, including six states and one territory. And Massachusetts is actually the second state to join the network as a state. And within Massachusetts, we have about 70 municipalities that, uh, that have uh, received the age-friendly designation. 
but in our region, in Franklin County, North Coven, only Deerfield so far has joined the network. That was in May 2019, uh, but so they haven't both gone to the next phase of the act. Um, but we have other examples from around the, the states, like in Berkshire, like um, in Brookline, in Cape Ann, and in different parts. And I just wanted to bring in a couple of examples of things uh, that these projects have achieved. These projects have started five, six years ago, but uh, for example, in East Friendly Berkshire, they, after doing all of this, they received an implementation grant to equip one of the senior centers with exercise equipment that year round. They've also organized job fairs for 50 plus residents who still want to work and connected them with employers and encouraged them to uh, employ older people. Places like East Friendly Bro Brookline, where they established a home sharing advisory service to help people who are not able to fully live in their own house anymore share it with someone else to, to, to help them stay there because most people want to age in place and stay in their community. They've also worked with local businesses to certify them as age friendly and encourage them to provide safety features for, uh, for elders as well as discounts and other programs. But there are many other programs both in communities and at the state level. In terms of community participation, LifePath, we received this grant to be the backbone organization to do the coordination. However, the process as it is designed uh, requires this strong community participation from the beginning to end. And so there's a lot of roles that we're trying to, uh, to, to fill, and we're trying to work with all these communities because um, it, it is what communities decide is better for them is the way we want to go. So uh, in, terms, in terms of roles, we're trying to create a steering committee, a regional that will overall see the overall direction, coordination of the projects and, and decisions, we will create work groups that will probably be domain specific and uh, help with needs assessment and planning for each of those domains, like transportation, for example, what's missing, what can we do with the resources that we already have, and what resources from outside can we get to help people with this particular domain. We're also going to have an advisory council to make sure that both made of elders to make sure to reach out to people who uh, maybe their voices are traditionally left out. Uh, and obviously working with the select boards because it is select boards that give us their stamp of approval, the, those the commitment letters to join the network will come from you. And also, if there's extra participation from select boards, we welcome it throughout this program that goes beyond just issuing these letters. And so in the past month or so, I've been engaging with different organizations in the community, with COAs, I've talked with Pat, and she is the one that was kind enough to make this, this connection with you all. We've talked also to nonprofits, people from the Village Neighbors Program, transit officials, anybody in the community is welcome. Also just interested residents. They don't have to represent an organization. Um, and so that's basically the important, important, important information that I wanted to share, and I just wanted to see uh, if there are any questions that, we can, that I can answer while I'm here. Uh, I have a question we can start with, but I'm sure there are others. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what you would, what you're expecting of us. I, I mean, we can sign this document. Right? You know, we can, we can say we agree with this in principle. It's a wonderful idea. Um, are you looking for, for example, for us to find a selectman that's willing to join your, uh, you, you know, one of your leadership teams or? Uh, I, I mean, so maybe I'm asking what, what it is what it is that Deerfield is doing that we would we would sort of do that same kind of thing. That's a wonderful question, and I think exactly like you said, the letter itself that's the minimum participation of, of the select board, just because ARP want to make sure that you all are green and we're not just in committed for communities. Um, and but extra, uh, uh, other than the letter of commitment, we are welcoming. Um, if anybody from the select board wants to be on our steering committee um, and work with us, the steering committee will probably have monthly meetings and we'll talk about the big picture here regionally. Then we definitely welcome that. Or if you want to nominate someone else from the town that you think is um, engaged, that would be great for this work. And that's basically what we're doing with Deerfield. Uh, as I mentioned to Tom, Deerfield has joined the network in 2019 before we took this grant, but they haven't moved past that enrollment stage. And now Deerfield is actually, the people in Deerfield are also working with the people in Waitley and in Sunderland 
these three towns share a senior center. And so Weekly and Sunderland will be encouraged to also join the, the join the network and then they can they can maybe form an action team with, and work on that subregion for them if that makes sense. Uh, but we also want to hear from them uh, for the region as, as a whole. But uh, like you said, the letter is that minimum participation. If we've already convinced you, that is wonderful. Um, and if we can get convince you to work with us more, if somebody feels engaged and wants to be part of the steering committee, um, then I am also taking nominations and trying to put together this team that will represent our entire county, um, not just Greenfield, who will kind of be representative here. Um, uh, yeah, and then once we've gone through the designation and uh, draw the network, then those committees will work more on specifics or needs assessments on 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 teams where uh, the town can, what plans could the town do on its own things that can be implemented locally and what plans we can do for example as a region as a whole or west county can just sit down the west county does it make sense for them to coordinate on things so those are things that will be determined in the later phases um, and that's why we want to engage people from all these different parts so they have the actual sense of what is needed and how uh, we can help all the people in these towns. When you said that, that, that you, one, of the count, one of the communities that's enrolled is the Berkshires, you know, so that sounds like they're doing a regional approach, n not, not a particular town. Exactly, exactly. That's the thing because, because the African Movement Organization are allowing a lot of autonomy to communities. So there's different models. Like you said, the Berkshires, the 32 towns that applied as one region and had one committee and had one action plan. There's also other models in other single towns. Obviously, that is the basic model. There's also, for example, the model of um, Cape Ann, which is four communities that work together and made an age and age friendly Cape Ann project. The same thing with the Northern Health Town Consortium. They joined all seven towns um, joined together and had one application because they think they can collaborate on the implementation of all planning. And so that's the thing that we're trying to determine here for Franklin, for Franklin County and North Wapen. Does it make sense to go regional? Does it make sense for each town to be the same or to, or to work in smaller clusters of groups? And as I said, that's not a decision that, that we can take as like that. This is by design made a participatory approach for towns to determine these for themselves. And so well, our job really is to get people together, create this community, have these conversations, so we can take those decisions in the next weeks and months of whether to apply as one region or to go in a smaller group. What else? I mean, to, to, to me, it's, you know, the, our needs have been in this area have been the same since the, the hills were born that you know the, the we we have no the, the transportation the, the on-call transportation service has been defunded to the point where it's no longer relevant in people's lives there are there is no senior housing in our town there's no plans for senior housing there's no prospects for senior housing anytime in the future that i know of um we have we don't really have i mean i'm looking at your eight prong your eight little groups we're we're, you know, the, the, the hill towns similarly situated to us have none of these things uh, either. And I mean, that's what that's what all of our little towns want. You know, in, in the hill towns, we want just our own little solutions. We we just need help paying for them. Well, we need a lot of help paying for them. And so, I mean, that that's what it comes down to. You know, it, it, the, the 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 survey that, that that is developed might be exquisite in in its detailed. Uh, you know answers to exactly what our needs are, but ultimately our needs are money, and it's our needs are money from Boston, and um, good luck with that. Yeah, well, I think I, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's definitely a huge inequality in resources from different places, uh, but I think this is really an opportunity uh, because the state has paid a lot of attention to age friendly projects. Um, uh, the state, as I said, and it joins the network as a state, uh, but it also provides um, uh, there's a lot of grants that I think the age friendly project would be helpful in, in getting that. For example, the Top Health Foundation uh, has been working with age friendly communities and providing those implementation uh, grants to some programs, as well as AARP, who have also uh, given some grants to towns. 
uh, after they've gone through their age 20 des designation and, and identified some solutions. Um, and, and so I think in terms of small, uh, in terms of uh, each town, we can definitely uh, use this designation as an opportunity to reach grants that maybe were not there. But I would say um, there's an even bigger opportunity to receive grants for, for groups of towns. Um, so for example, transportation. I, I don't know what they've done this, but I think that the, the Northern Hill Town Consortium uh, it was also one of the things why they wanted to work together and not separately is they were looking at transportation solutions and there's more possibility to, to pay for services uh, together that can function across all these regions. One van paid for by seven towns is much cheaper than one van paid, paid for by a single town. Um, so there's definitely opportunities for collaboration and opportunities for getting uh, e external grants um, in terms of implementation, as well as things that, that we can try to do with the, with the existing resources or, or with organizations around us um, that we can redirect some services. So uh, I hear you, I hear your concern. It, it's not easy to, I think, it, like you said, it's easy to lay out all the these assessments of the plan that's paying for it is hard. But I think there's an opportunity here, especially with this wave and the age-friendly um, uh, uh, designation or brand is now um, is now working a lot. It's not just towns. Universities want to be age-friendly. Health systems want to be age-friendly. So I think there's an opportunity for funding uh, through this program. So what are we specifically being asked to agree to right now? To designate Conway as an age-friendly community or... It, it, like you said, Bob, the, in the Berkshires, they've taken a regional approach. Are we being asked to join a consortium of, of towns to become? Yeah, so. Like, no, like what, you, what do we have to decide on, like, right now, I guess, yeah. is my question. But. <laughs> are you so asking right us now, on whether, whether we support the idea? Right now, I'm here to support for the idea. That's my game for, um, uh, but right now, I am hoping if you have someone, if you have someone you want to nominate to be on the steering committee and to be part of this process and to represent Conway, uh, but I'd love to get their name through Tom, Tom has my email. Um, and and if not, then we'll keep in contact through Tom, through PAC. Um, and uh, once we've, we've made the, those decisions of where, of, of a client, then I can work with with, with someone. I, I can spend a lot of time helping with the application and with the letter uh, later on. But what I was coming for here is to just give an idea to get your support, uh, which I am hearing, and to see if, some, if, if there's a nomination of someone wants to be on the CM committee. Yeah, so the designation comes after the needs assessment and the action plan? No, it comes before. It comes. Oh. Uh, the designation comes first. There is the uh, uh, there is the applying and sending the letter of commitment uh, makes you designated. But the designation doesn't mean we are age friendly. It just means we're committed to do this work. And actually, the designation expires after uh, about three years if nothing has been done yet. Uh, but we do the designation. We get that in, and then we move to doing a needs assessment. And and your uh, your grant pays for you to coordinate the needs assessment and action plan? Yes, yeah, the grant pays for me as, as the program coordinator to work on this um, from beginning to end. So um, obviously I will not be sitting down and doing these assessments by myself. Um, I'm trying to get people, like I said, community participation is really important to this program, but, but I will be given a lot of technical assistance and I will be spending my time working with all of the towns that are interested. In other towns that have done this, have they had a select board member be the person that that uh, joins your your committee, or would it be somebody from the council on the aging? Uh, other programs have had uh, not every program had had someone from a select board, but some had. Uh, there's usually people from from councils and aging. Uh, there's people from regional planning organizations. There's people from nonprofits from. Um, big healthcare organizations, for example. And so the communities include people from different sectors, but the local official select board members are more than welcome to be part of it um, as much as they can, as much as their time allows. But we don't have to decide that today. 
but you do not have to decide that today. Today we don't have to actually take any decision. We just wanted to give you an idea and uh, right. um, uh, just you can think about it and take your time, but I'm already getting a lot of support and excitement to this project, which is really what I came for. Yeah, great. Uh, we, we certainly have the high percentage of elderly people in our town. So, although I might be the only one of the three of us, I don't know how old you are, Phil, but uh, Eric, I suspect not. I'm already thinking of that. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> it's that conversation tonight with my husband. Thank you. So, are we, so we should, we should uh, ask our Council of Aging person um, if yeah. she's interested and, and then talk about this next week and make the appointment. Or somebody else in the Council of Aging. Yeah. You know, yeah. Patricia yeah. does a million things. I don't know that she'll yeah. want to jump in. I would even, I would volunteer if there's no one from Council uh, on Aging. I would. Then, then, then you would have, you could report on that every, and then every I other week when, yes. we, when we have our meetings here. So that would be great. Do you want to do that now? To what? Just volunteer for? Say that you would. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm totally willing to participate. I think that would be excellent. Okay, all right. All right. Um, okay, so make a motion to appoint uh, Erica as uh, uh, select select person Erica Goldman as our representative. To. Uh, and I would second that. Thank you. Then, so, so what was our next step? We should vote. So we should vote. And we'll all say aye. Yes. In fact, we do. Erica said yes. yes. So, and uh, what would our next step be to, to continue with the enrollment stage? So, and so for now, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to get you a nominee. We are going to um, uh, get the steering committee together to talk, and then for our next step, I will contact uh, probably Tom, if that's the contact person that you're comfortable with, and work with you. I will show you, I can show you some samples of, of previous letters, um, and I can uh, do a lot of the work fill in the application. But that's still, uh, I would say, at least a few weeks away. Uh, but right now, I think the next step is to get me Erica's information, and then once we have our committee, we'll have our first meeting, and you guys will have a direct line into what happens there. This is great. That's great. Okay. What it was starting to sound like was the Green Communities Program, and I don't know if you're familiar with that state program, but towns signed up to be a, to the Green Communities Program, but they get offered a big slug of money to, to spend on doing a project, and then they have to report back on how they spent that money. But it, there's a huge, you know, I mean, Phil, you were talking about the money, and, and so, so that is really what caused the Green Communities Program to grow across the state was the, the offer of a lot of money that you could spend on what was important. That would do it. Man, that would do it, right. And it's managed by your energy committee. So, you know, a big slug of money managed by our Council on Aging would be a wonderful incentive here. Okay, well, thank you. All right, well, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, maybe you can connect with Erica through email later when you have time. Sure. Um, and other than that, this has been a pleasure. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Noor. So our next one is uh, of the Mohawk Trail Entrepreneur Challenge Program. Is there someone on the call that's going to talk to that? I Jeffrey? Are you? Uh, yes, Jeffrey. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Snow. Uh, yes, Snow. Jeffrey yeah. Here. yeah. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate some time. I, I apologize. I have to. Uh, be off the call at seven sharp, uh, but I think that'll be ample time. Uh, I'm from my organization called Lever. Uh, we're a nonprofit uh, focused on economic development in uh, northern Bergen County and and into the northern tier. Um, we're based in North Adams, and I'm here to tell you about a new program that we're launching, the Mohawk Trail Entrepreneur Challenge. Uh, I, you are a Mohawk Trail Woodland Partnership Town, and our, our challenge is aimed at furthering the goals of the Mohawk Trail Woodlands Partnership. And my ask this evening is that you help us identify entrepreneurs in your town who would like to participate in our challenge and compete for a $25,000 grant to launch their business and create jobs in Congo. Um, participants in the challenge will receive free business coaching from our expert team at Lever. They'll get access to uh, a variety of experts and mentors who will help them advance their business idea and will continue to support them even if they don't win the award money. 
We're looking for entrepreneurs who meet three criteria. One, they need to create jobs in one or more of the 16 Mohawk Trail Women's Partnership member communities. Two, their business idea must relate to the natural woodland resources of the region. Uh, these are businesses that relate to the woodlands but are sustainable. A good example is Zora Outdoor in Charlemont, uh, with, with their offerings of whitewater rafting and zipline canopy tours. Another example we found in another in Tennessee, a company that makes flooring, but it only harvests trees that have fallen. They're not they're not cutting any down any trees to make uh, high end flooring. The third criteria is that we're looking for startups only, companies less than two years old and with less than half a million dollars in revenue. The challenge will. Uh, be completed online and remotely, so uh, respecting this COVID era. It will take place between January and March of 21. Uh, we're excited to help entrepreneurs in the region, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, we sent you information, I believe, electronically. Yeah. Our website is leverinc.org, org, L-E-V-E-R-I-N-C.org. And again, our ask is that you share this information with entrepreneurs of your town, or if you'd like, just give us their names, and we'll uh, and we'll reach out to that directly. So, uh, I have to answer any questions. Hey, uh, Jay, this is uh, Phil Cantor, uh, Conway Selectman. I, I have a, a question about the, wh why did you guys decide to do a winner take all twenty five thousand dollar thing instead of uh, you know a thousand dollars to as a halter fee to everybody that applies or something like that. Um, yeah, that's uh, a good question. Uh, we <clears throat> we uh, have run a number of challenges over the years, and this is our, our typical award. Um, we we usually apologize to the entrepreneur because uh, we we appreciate the twenty five thousand dollars. It doesn't go very far, um, and so uh, we we feel like that's the best strategy to. Uh, ensure that we'll really get companies off the ground and these companies can get traction, they can uh, attract revenues, and they can create jobs. You mentioned Zora Outdoor, and but but they're clearly not less than a year old. Um, that, that's, that's just a Correct. Thing. We would be looking for, I'm sorry to speak over you, but yeah, we would be interested in the Zora Outdoor, uh, whenever they started. Um, Okay. Correct. Yeah. We're looking for new enterprises. Yep. I mean, that's quite a limit to have a company that that new. We, we have a baby outdoor company. We, we do. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, so we can try to find the names of these companies. We can put this in our on our website. We could have how, this in can our, I ask our how, newspaper. How, can I ask how complicated the uh, application process is for a would-be uh, applicant? How many pages? How how much time is involved in doing it? Thank you for that great question. It is very uncomplicated. It shouldn't take more than five minutes. Great. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, this thank is you very much. Appreciate Tom. your giving me time. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to put a notice on the website and try to get it in the town newsletter. Um, as, as you uh, as you uh, come up with more information, uh, send it to me and uh, and I'll keep everyone updated. Thank you very much. I really uh, appreciate it. One more quick question: There is a group that 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 feels like they're doing this kind of thing. They're they're called rural rural Commonwealth. Have you been in contact with them, or I could contact them? I would appreciate that. We we we're not aware of this group, but we love to we love to get an introduction. Thank you. Thank you. And then one one more question, Jake. Is there uh, is there an exclusion for cannabis related companies? Uh, so long as I, I no, as long as they have that some connection to the woodland resource. Well, isn't that where they grow cannabis? Yes. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just why. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Take care, everyone. Okay. Bye -bye. Thanks. You too. Uh,
flood mitigation. Joe, I think I heard you join the call. And Michelle's here for that and, too. And I see Michelle here in live and in person. Even better. Uh, oh, okay. Right, Michelle, if you um, sat if you sat right up at that table, I think you might be in, in the Michelle. camera. Oh, so, so I think it, we, we have it set up so we'll catch that corner of the table. Right. Tom, is there another microphone here, Michelle? Uh, so Tom, can kind of split the we can right. split this one. Thank you. So, Joe, do you want to talk about the the um, the property that's for sale? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, I got a text from somebody who was not in my contact saying they couldn't make the 6.30 meeting. Is that Kimberly or Janet? Uh, no, Janet's here. Janet's so here. It, it might. Could be it Kimberly. Might, it, must, it, must be, it must be Kimberly. Okay. Um, where's the... No, I'm, I'm here. I'm just talking and I was on mute. Sorry. Oh, Hi, Kimberly. Okay. <laughs> Um, we didn't really have a plan on how to do this. Uh, I can start, and Kimberly, if you could jump in. Um, sure. uh, I would say almost a decade ago, we worked with Kimberly and the town of Ashfield and uh, consultants that the COG, FERCOG hired, and we did an assessment, a uh, fluvial erosion assessment, I believe, it, if I've got the name correct, uh, of the South River. This is different than the floodplain. It involves uh, sedimentation, opening up floodplains, uh, looking at things that might erode highways. So there's a lot of different factors, not just flooding like on a, on a flood map. And so the whole river was mapped and we identified sections of the river that are called reaches where they had specific types of problems. And the, the number one priority at the time was this parcel of land that we're proposing to talk about, which is just above the Main Street Bridge. For the old timers, it's the Joey Akishin property. For the new timers, it's the place that burned down two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a four acre parcel. It's a four acre parcel. It has three quarters of an acre uh, between the South River and Main Street. The rest of it is on the other side of the river and connects with Academy Hill. Um, the, this parcel on the other side of the river is the old floodplain. The, the um, South River got redirected, uh, I think in the flood of 1938, and it no longer has access to its floodplain. And access to floodplains is a great way to eliminate flooding. So the plan was to create access to that parcel of land uh, by removing some retaining walls and things that were done back in the 40s, I think. And we, at the time, uh, John O'Rourke was involved from the Select Board Committee, and John and Janet and myself went and met with the property owners, and they were unwilling to discuss the sale of the property at any reasonable price, and there was still a, a property on it at the time. Um, I noticed just recently there was a for sale sign there, brought it to, uh, I think, to Janet and uh, Tom's attention, and I did talk with the owners, and they're putting it up for sale, the whole four-acre parcel, uh, for $169,000, and they're calling it a riverfront property. And they're, they're, sort of marketing theme is that there's not a lot of riverfront property left, so they play up the, you know, the riverfront access. Um, our needs are for the floodplain, which is across the river. I don't know that this group that's on the call has any particular use for the parcel between the river and Main Street, so there, there might be other opportunities for the town to do something with that. Uh, I've heard comments like, you know, a park or parking area or two-family house was mentioned, and, you know, for uh, affordable housing. Um, but the main interest of this group that's on, on the phone call is 
the flood plain on the other side and creating access to it. Uh, Kimberly, do you want to add anything to that part of it? Sure. Um, well, you did a great job, Joe. I don't know if there's much I can or I can add a few details. So I sent um, Tom a handout that shows a map, an aerial photo with a proposed um, work that could be done on the property. Does, does everyone have a copy of that? Tom sent it to us. Yeah, I it on my phone. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Great. I, so, I sent it as an um, email. Sorry. Yeah, I didn't, no, no, uh, yeah, no, I didn't make a hard copy. Like, yeah. Paper. Um, but, like, if you are able to bring up the, the attachment and open it, um, you'll see on the aerial kind of what, um, on the map, what Joe was describing. So, right now, there are actually two berms that were put in. Um, one is shown in red and the other one is shown in yellow. So, it's the red, the, the berm that's shown in red that would potentially have some um, breaches made in it to allow the water to come in and access its old abandoned floodplain. And then the, the berm that is shown in yellow uh, would be reinforced uh, to protect the houses on the other side. This. Um, and then those uh, boulder structures that are shown are um, what are called weirs, V-shaped weirs, and their purpose is at certain um, high flows to help direct the water back to the center of its channel. So this uh, design, like Joe mentioned, was done, um, this conceptual design was done in 2013, and at the time, there was a cost, a pretty detailed cost estimate that was done that had the cost of the project at about um, $255,000. So we um, are in a good position right now because the Mohawk Trail Woodlands Partnership MVP Action Grant that the town is participating in could um, pay to have the final designs, an updated cost estimate, the hydraulic modeling, you know, all the work that would need to be done to put the project out um, for bid for construction. So um, both Joe, Janet, and Michelle are working with me and the consultant team and also with Todd Alanik from um, Asheville to prioritize and discuss um, all of the projects that were identified in this 2013 report. And because this property is now uh, for sale, it presents um, a really great opportunity to advance, advance this work. And originally, this upstream project was part of a bigger project that included the work that was done at the South Me Meadow site that the town owns. But like Joe said, um, we couldn't um, do anything at the time because the the landowner, the property owner, um, just wanted way too much money for it. So um, anyway, it's a, an exciting opportunity to think about and discuss um, the, uh, also if there were ways or ideas to um, not only realize the, the flood mitigation benefits of the project, but you know, if the town did have other ideas about passive recreation or, or something else, um, you know, now's the time to be thinking about that as well. So, uh, anyway, for, for once it seems like the stars are, are kind of aligning in a good way if the town decides that they want to move forward with it. The, um, the price certainly now is, is much more reasonable 
um, depending on, you know, if we did kind of carry out or continue with this um, idea of the town purchasing it, that money that the town spends could be used as match for the construction project, for example. Um, and, you know, if the town is... Could you elaborate um, on that last bit? Could, could you elaborate sure. on that last bit? So, the, about the match? Yeah. Yeah, so for example, um, if, the, if the town did decide to move forward with, um, you know, another MVP action grant would fund the const this construction work, a uh, 25% match would be required. So the cost um, that the town, or the cost of the property, the amount of money that the town spends on acquiring the property could count towards the match for that construction grant. We would have to make sure to time it well, um, appropriately, because typically for these grant programs, the um, eligible match, the clock starts ticking when the grant is actually awarded in the case of the MVP grant. Another grant program that could pay for construction is the same one that paid for the South River Meadow Project, the 319 program through MassDEP, and that match, match clock actually um, starts ticking when the RFR is released. So in order to be able to claim um, the money is match, you know, we're going to have to be very strategic about uh, when when the money is actually spent. You said that the construction was estimated at 255000 in 2013. In 2013. Do you know, uh, yeah. you know an estimate of what that would be now? I came um, up with the... No, I, Three hundred and fifty. I, I, I don't. Of my head. Uh, so Tom is saying perhaps three hundred and fifty thousand. Um, I mean, I, 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 you know, that sounds reasonable. I mean, these projects aren't. Um, the cost of the project typically comes like with the environmental permitting. It's not necessarily the materials or the actual construction, but we would have, um, as part of the project we're currently working on, we would have an updated um, cost estimate that would be detailed enough to put the project out to bid. So does anybody know? Hi, uh, Janet. Yeah. Yes, I just want to briefly maybe give this a little more context. Um, at the time uh, that this first fluvial geomorphic assessment was done, um, there were at least 24 sections of the RIP, 24 potential projects I need. And working with the select board at the time and the Friends of the South River and Nick Miller, who, you know, did the boots on the ground work, uh, they have the top five prior top five projects were making the most impact in flood mitigation and associated benefits. The, the top five projects were identified. And this at the time, the up to 24, this at the time was the number one in terms of having the most impact downstream on erosion, flooding, you know, environmental improvements and so forth. And uh, Joe was there at my house at the time when, a bunch of, when we got together, um, there was a need to try to move quickly and because the town did not own this and we couldn't buy it reasonably, that's why the project then was picked up for the South River Met because we did own it. Um, in this current uh, the study current assessment that we're working on, we had seen a couple of weeks ago and uh, the first meeting a couple weeks ago and 
I asked Nick if this project would still have the most impact, the most um, you know, scientific impact, and his answer was an emphatic yes. So therefore, and then suddenly, lo and behold, here's the for sale sign. I mean, how lucky could we get? Um, clearly, uh, Joe, could talk a little bit more about the rebuilding potential for other, you know, private or commercial. Somebody else could buy this quick if the town doesn't move. So I, I, I throw that out. And then later on, another question. So I have some ideas on how the town could move quickly, but just in general, you know, like with that thing, we were looking for housing, for elderly housing. You know, there's a house city for a long time, and maybe looking at fixing up that house or this house. And typically, by the time the town, you know, gets close to maybe even acting, the opportunity is long gone. So. This, this would be a, you know, a real challenge, but I think you all can do it. <laughs> okay. Um, the CPA, I believe, was mentioned as a possibility. Um, that I guess the planning board, the planning board supports it, but we don't see this as necessarily a planning board project. We see this more as a town project. The planning board will most likely get involved. Um, there's a potential that we develop a new kind of uh, district or mapping of the river, which would identify the hazards other than flooding, including flooding for the river. But we don't, we, I don't know who should take the lead, and I suspect it's the select board. I second that. <laughs> so, I, I, so, so, so I guess our ask is that you pursue further than I did. I did talk to Marsha Evans, and she's the, she's the owner. They, they have multiple trusts, so if you try to track them down, it's very difficult. I think the property might be owned by three or four sequences of trust, but in the end, it's Marsha and John Evans, and they live in Waitley. Um, and if you call the number on the, on the sign, I don't know whether we can do some kind of a retainer. I hadn't appreciated the timing problem, I, I don't know if Kimberly's saying if we ran out and bought it today that we couldn't use it as our share, but I certainly feel that, that if, if these people are correct, John and, and, and the people there, geology group, that this will minimize the flooding of town. We've had two events in, in my time in town where the center of town flooded and the water ran down Academy Hill and the front of the library and then through um, Bovio's property and back into the river. That part of town is lower than the top of the bridge. So when the water rises under the bridge, then it goes through this floodplain out onto Academy Hill and then across in front of the library. It also did it in the flood of 38. I, I don't know about the period in between, but so at least three times in the last 80 years. So this is greater than the 100-year flood that they talk about. This is three times in 80 years that we flooded the center of town, and we still have property that hasn't been repaired. I think the fair property across from the town hall that you, that you can see out your window, I'm not sure that that's habitable yet. Now that got filled with water. The, the oil tank floated up in the basement, and you know the, the house has been in a distressed condition, and that could happen again. So. My push and my priority would be that the town does something so we can address this flooding of uh, the lower part of Main Street. So, Joe, Joe, this is Philip. I, first of all, I'll just say it's nice to see sort of the river rats back together again. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> no, it's the sewer rats. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, well this. Um, so the the. Uh, the, the parcel, the, the, the separate three, point, uh, three acres that's south of the South River? Yes. That is, that, that is not a buildable lot, correct? I, it's, I don't believe it is. I'm, I, I'm not the ultimate authority, but I don't think the wetlands people would let you do it. It could make a park. I mean, you could put some trails in there. The, the kids have gone in and built forts and stuff oh, yeah. like that. And you know, and for a small for a week or so, once every 50 years, it may get flooded. 
But other than that, I, I think it, it could certainly be a recreation area if that's something that Dallas well, I, I guess wanted what, to do. What I was getting at is that, you know, is, is that there could be a possibility of subdividing it, this parcel into the uh, the three quarters of an acre north of the South River and then the the other, which has the building lot and seems to be what the so the, the seller is looking into, it, it, it deems the most value. And, um, uh, and it, so, I mean, that, that's my, my one thought. And the other thought is that um, if, if there's a proposal for senior housing with, with all of the grant streams that are available for that and the various mandatory funding streams that are available for that, could that also end up being funding for the river work that's part and parcel of this property? Right. Um, the idea of splitting it was one that uh, Janet and John and I pursued with them. They weren't interested in selling the back and keeping the house lot at the time. Is that not correct, Janet? But if the town owned the yeah. entire property, the town could... Right. I, I thought maybe what, what uh, mm -hmm. Phil was suggesting is that we try to buy the back end. We could try it again. We don't need the front, but the front is where the building lot could go. And there and must be 169 for the entire right. parcel. It, 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 is it possible? Is the building lot really a building lot? In other words, there, yeah. yes. I imagine there well, might be it, a footprint issue, like it, because there's still you, a footprint. Yeah, yeah, you have to build on the. It's a substantial footprint, footprint, though. Yeah, it's so. Well, so if the town it, bought. It has the, a, I, go ahead. I believe it has an existing foundation yeah. and yes. a leach. Leachfield septic system. Yes. Yeah. So if the town bought the entire property, it could attempt to sell the building lot. You know, at a. Um, I don't. It, I don't. Well, it's not a one-acre lot, and it doesn't have enough frontage, so I, that may be more. Uh, uh, that may be. It only has fifty. It's a. It's a. If that was taken out as a building lot, and I and I don't believe it's separately needed. It might be, but. They're selling all, all three, there's actually three parcels involved. Um, it would become, unless it's grandfathered, it would be difficult to do that. In other words, if it's deeded as a four acre parcel with 50 feet of access to Main Street, I think it would be hard to cut three quarters of an acre out. You'd be making a more non-conforming lot out of it. Mm. You can just I, the, the town might find a way around that, but under the current bylaws, it might be difficult. Okay. Certainly, if the town owned it all, we could restore the, the building on that property. Right. And the town, the town would have the most control over what goes there if right. you plot it all. And then. So, who can we get answers to that, or, or whether that could be a building lot or what we could do with it? The planning board? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think it, it it can be restored to its former life because it it certainly is grandfathered. I I haven't been able to determine whether it's a four acre back lot with fifty nine feet of frontage on Main Street, in which case it's a legal building lot. And then it would just be about placing the building in the right place. If it's somehow not a four-acre lot, then it's a legally non-conforming building lot, which means it, it has to, um, it's a, you have to jump through more hurdles, you have to get a special permit and things like that. I think it's doable, but without more research, I don't want to say that state that publicly, yeah. So the, the part that the town's really interested in, as far as the floodplain and flood mitigation goes, is the part on the other side of the river, right? Right. For the mitigation, yeah. Right. So, and the, I guess the question is whether, like, you can, if we were to buy the entire piece of property, whether we can separate one from the other. But we've had a lot of conversations about the fact that we need more space. Right. You know, what to do in this building, yeah. whether we should right. have offices, well, you know, whether we can maintain the second floor of this building for basketball and storage right. and the, the Halloween rag shack parade. I mean, you know, to me, events. honestly, and it seems like for $169,000, like, this is kind of like a no-brainer. But, like, whether, you know, whether the town does something with it or not, if that's really the price that they're willing to 
sell it for, and there's someone who could buy it as a private individual and could, you know, possibly, you know, do something with the floodplain on the other side because we don't have any answers to these questions about, you know, can you subdivide the property or not? I mean, this almost sounds like to me like, like we ought to hedge our bets. You know, like I'd rather own a hundred and sixty nine thousand dollar property that we could like then sell in five years if we decide we can't do anything with it. But, but we could put we could put our space needs on that or that, or that, that too, right, right. exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so like, I, I mean. There, 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 you know, when the town buys property, it's never bought until town meeting says it's bought. Well, town meeting but you'd have to put a, yeah. you'd, you'd have to sign a buy-sell agreement with these people, and then yeah. the yeah. other question I have is, and I can't really mention, there may be a legal limit to what we can pay for the parcel. I, I always thought it was 125 percent of assessed value, but Kimberly, you said a pr you had to do an appraisal. Well, I was thinking that if the town was going to look for, um, like, try to get some grant funding to help purchase the property, or um, you know, talk to Franklin Land Trust and try to get some help purchasing the property. If you're using, you know, public funds like that, then there are restrictions about um, how much money can be paid for the, the property, but, um, and you might, if the money was coming out of the Community Preservation Act, and probably Janet knows this better than I do, but there might be some restrictions too. Like you have to do a, you know, an appraisal, um, and you can, I, but, um, you know, if you're just going to use available funds, and maybe this is a question for the town council too, like um, how much negotiation can the town do on the asking price and what are the constraints of how much you can pay um, for the property? I, I believe it's 125% of something, but I can't remember what it's <laughs> But so that's yeah. step one. The, the, the appraised. We need to find the appraised. We need to get the property appraised. Is it the appraised value, Tom? Or the assessed. Yeah. Appraised or assessed. It's not going to be the assessed value. It'll be the appraised value. And, okay. And doesn't the appraised value? Believe, I believe that it's 125% of the appraised value. I think so we have right. to get it appraised, and it's only assessed at sixty thousand. They have it assessed as a building lot, which is a you know sixty is a typical building lot. But they're asking one sixty nine. So yeah. I guess if we get it appraised, so is that something the selectmen are in a position to do? Yeah, we, we yes. did we did that just last year. We we got the. Um, the, the, the property appraised next to the Conway Inn that's about to become uh, a packy store, just to, preliminary to discussing the purchase of that, which we never even ended up discussing from. Mm. But it, it, it wasn't that expensive and it provides useful information. But so I guess if, if the appraisal comes in at like 80,000 and we can only spend 125% of the appraised value of that. Mm. Well, then we just put it out there and see, and see if they'll accept. That, that's their asking price. They may settle for less of that. You know? yeah. We don't know what their real price is. And I assume the appraisal takes into account whether or not like this is usable, like whether the property on the other side of the river is I actually... really doubt it is because it's, it's very level. I mean, part of it is lower than the river. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, ask the Conservation Commission if that's buildable. You know, it's, most of it's within 200 feet of the river. They're never going to turn it out. Right, and it's also in the floodplain. It's definitely in the floodplain. Totally. So yeah. it would have to be built you know, according to floodplain regulations. It might end up being on stilts or... I, I, I doubt that... I would guess that it's not buildable. Only part that's probably buildable is on this side, yeah. you know, on, on the Main Street side. Well, the appraisal would tell us that, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Right. It, it should. It better. It yeah. better tell us it than it was late. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, well so, then maybe our starting ash should be, can the selectman get that property appraised? 
So and possibly have, notify the owners that we're having it appraised and we're slightly interested in the property. I don't know if we could get a right of first refusal or not. I don't. Yeah, I would. I would recommend. We got. We got the feeling. I think Joe did a little bit of background research on these people on the Evans before we even met with them, and it was not all that positive, as I recall. And when we did see them in person, um, that was they were not friendly, and that it was going to be a tough negotiation. I mean, they wanted. They were. They told us at the time. They were. They were like saving it for the town to have to buy it for a sewer for a, uh, a sewer system, um, you know. And they were thinking for four hundred thousand dollars. And I just remember that just to, just to give you a little, um, a little that that it's going to be difficult negotiations, and and you should consider you know how to find a really good uh, negotiator. Um, and uh, you know it's going to be challenging, but there's a, you know people who can do this. And um, anyway, just that little bit of heads up. Uh, you know, it's, it's, um, they're they're business only people. Um, Are they own a um, number of properties in Conway? Um, yeah, Jen, I, I I know that guy Evans. I I, I he, he's all right, and I I I, I know. I, I have a friend who's a real good friend of his, as well. Well? Well, it sounds like you are a negotiator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got yourself into that one. Uh, well. Yeah. well. Well, I think um, as a board, we, can, we, we all are supporting I, getting it appraised. Yeah, I would support and, getting it appraised and pursuing the, pur the purchase of that property. Well, um, step one first. OK, <laughs> yeah. yeah, getting it appraised. Yeah. <laughs> So and then the other thing, the, the other thing that I wanted to put out there, and I don't, I don't know if everybody knows this, and I might get in trouble for saying this, but the town actually does have an account that uh, a fund that can only be used for the purchase of real estate. And um, you may recall the sale of the former Conway Grammar School up on the hill, um, and that money has been sitting in a fund um, that can, that can only be used in the future to purchase real estate. How much money is in that? And well, there you go. You got the money. No, no, it ain't that easy because because <laughs> be, because um, the, I, I believe that that amount is approximately ninety thousand, give or take a few. Yeah, that um, sounds about right. Yeah. But, but the but uh, good start. So, so the thing about that is that I, from when I first found out about that, I think I and, and several others uh, have sort of thinking that that's sort of claimed almost for future employee office relief fund, like what, that, that, that some solution to our poor work, to our p poor municipal employee workplace environment um, is, gonna, is gonna need a kit, is gonna need that. And we don't, there is no proposal, There's, it's just something that's in, been sitting there, but I, I think well, the, rip, the the town side of the property could, could be right. helpful. And so, right. so we, we, could, we could build that office building on that cement slab. And see, I, I actually so, thought of that, but I was too embarrassed to admit no. that. No. Um, we could do senior housing, tiny senior houses down on the first floor, and then the office, the town Ah, houses. so in the event of a flood, we save the town employees. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not going to flood there. We're going to flood the other side. Oh, uh, okay. Oh. So, so you know, so I, that, but that there is a fund, and that can be used. Um, I don't, I don't know, uh, I don't know how popular we would be with our town employees if we do that. But it's, uh, yeah. well, I, I, I was aware that you, I, that the money would be for land purchase, but I didn't realize that it had to be for employees. That no, it doesn't. There, there's no, there's, the no, there, that's, yeah. we've actually never discussed that point as a select board that I'm aware of, and it's it's just something that I always just sort of assumed. But there had never been a competing or or another proposal that I had ever heard that um, that you know that that it could go towards. I, and, and and I, I do was a selectman. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, I, I do support. I, I was a, go ahead. Go ahead, <laughs> go ahead Joe. Um, I was a selectman when we sold the property, and I remember that, that the funds had to be designated, and I think that's why they're in a separate account. Yeah. But I had never heard about it was reserved for the employees. No, no, it's not. 
It's not, but it was just in my own mind it was. Um, but, okay. but that's just because there had, there's never been any other uh, proposal well, this, upon uh, this, which to spend it on. This doesn't contradict that. Yeah, no. I think. Um, but if we could put that 90 towards the purchase and then maybe some CPA money, you can always replace the 90 later when you find out what you're going to do for the town employees. Uh, I uh, now how about I believe uh, uh, Glenn still has some good experience with these uh, the folks, but if you know if another offer comes in while we're discussing or considering or even getting appraised, um, you know it would be gone. So I think you could consider a uh, putting down some money for a right of first refusal. And, 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 you know, negotiate, I mean, getting a sentence to write a first refusal, um, you know, maybe subject to some appraisal or something, and then ultimately subject to uh, town meeting approval, but to, to get something um, firm so that it doesn't flip out and get sold to someone else. Janet, how much would that typically be? I have no idea. No, we, we can't spend any money. We can't spend any money without town meeting approval. Except for the appraisal. Well, we, can, we can do the appraisal without town yeah, meeting Yeah, approval. yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I meant on, on like the, yeah, the real estate. Okay. We, we couldn't I, spend I the rent. Well, a deposit, you know, so a deposit is whatever, I don't know, 10% or something. It's not, it's not going to be the purchase. Well, we can't even do that. The retainer of some. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, look, towns can't, towns and cities don't all wait for their next annual meeting to buy a real important piece of property. You know, maybe the town will lose, you know, if the town doesn't, if the town meeting doesn't approve, then we would lose that deposit, but, you well, know, you presu can't. Presumably we're talking a special town meeting here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but you're still, you know, a couple months away, and so, you know, at least, it's, right? I don't know. You know how fast. It take like three weeks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but like I said, if you know something else comes in, and then, you know now real estate is is really hot now. People are like moving in and buying all yeah. kinds of land. So, uh, so don't but, lose it. But yeah. we can we can yeah. make an offer to them based on town meeting approval. Well, that's what it has to be by law. Approval. But we could do that before the before town meeting, without waiting for the town meeting. No, it would be contingent on a town meeting vote. Yeah. Right. right, right. But we could at least right. agree and for. It's one of those super majority votes too, right? Isn't it? One of ninety nine out of ten. I believe so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. two thirds vote by land. I believe. Yeah. Not nine tenths. <laughs> <All right. laughs> it just feels that way. Can we at least agree to pay for an appraisal on the property? That's something yes. that we can. Okay. Yes, we can do that. And that also means letting them know we're doing it. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I mean, then be... you can do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say we, uh, I would want to, I would want to meet with them, with the seller, like you know, ASAP, just because. If a, if they're, if it's sold or nearly sold, then the, the appraisal, even though it's just a few hundred bucks, is still. Not worth doing, it, but um, so you would have to just talk to them just for that, just for that basis. But yeah. Joe, would it be the planning board or our town council that would tell us, be able to tell us what our options are for the property piece of it? Probably the planning board have to do more research. What What's making it difficult for me is the the three parcels add up to four acres, and I think it could become a back lot. It does. It, a back lot in Conway has to have a right of way to a public road, and that 55, 59 feet would be their access. So it probably is a legal four acre lot, but only three quarters of, the, of it is accessible for a building, I think. Yeah. So why is that a problem? So it's, it, 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 one option is it, it's a legal building lot, but it only has three quarters of an acre of usable property. The rest is wetlands. Um, it could be that it's a, they're selling it as illegally non-conforming, but I'm not sure that they're correct if it's really one four-acre parcel. Now, if it's three separate parcels, 
and the deed where the property is is only the three quarter acre, um, then it's a legally non-conforming building lot now. It, because it's not one acre and it doesn't have 200 feet of frontage. You know? Which is the case on all of Main Street. All, all of Main Street and Conway, I think, except for one or two houses, are grandfathered because they, they no longer, they don't have 200 feet of frontage and a lot of them don't even have one acre. You know? yeah. I, I can do some more research on that, but I have to go look at the deeds and see how the deeds are set up. Well, wouldn't the and the appraisal will do that also? Now they make they, they probably would do the same thing, yeah. right? And anyone, any other potential buyer would have to figure all of that out. I mean, it's right. It's, exactly. It seems like a complicated property, so. Joe, I know the assessor's map does not have the acreage of lot two point three on it, but comparing it with with say four point one, um, or even. Uh, four uh, up above, uh, I'm not sure that you do get, um, that you do get four acres. It's looking a little bit more like 3.9 to me, but that, that's okay. my side. It's advertised as four plus, but I haven't checked it. And I also oh. can't find parcel 2.2, .2, so I don't, I don't know right. why this is one. <laughs> That's why I said it needs a little more research. You know, somebody and knowing these people, you'd probably want to verify that it's actually four acres because it might. You might be right. It might be three point nine. That you know, that's where some of the research needs to be done. It's, the sign says four plus acres. You know. I'm just looking at lot two point three in relation to lot four, and it looks smaller to me, and. You know, lot four would not bring the two and the two point one up to four acres. Then, then they would be correct. It would be a legally non-conforming lot of three point nine acres. So. Certainly, is not a legal building lot if it's only three quarters of an acre. It has to be over an acre, and it doesn't have two hundred feet of frontage. So it, it would just be a big lot, but it doesn't have proper front. So it would have it would have enough acreage, but not enough frontage to be a legal building lot. It's a 3.9 acre lot with only 59 feet of frontage. So it, it would it would be legally non-conforming because of the frontage doesn't have 200 feet of frontage. So, so they may be right. It, it's, they're selling it as a legally as a grandfathered lot, yeah. but it which like, it certainly like, is. If, like if someone were to come in and buy this, even though it doesn't have the proper frontage, I mean, are there ways like with the zoning Can committee with the, or yeah, or with or you know like the permits you have to pull in Greenfield when you do like a renovation? Like, is it possible that someone could come in buy this property and build something there? Even given that it's not enough acreage and there's not enough frontage, you you can replace the building that's there. If you want to extend the building, then you need a special permit from the planning board. So someone could build on that existing footprint of the house that burned down. You can build on that okay. foundation, or you could replace the building that was destroyed. But if you want to enlarge it in any way, then you would need a special permit. So what was there was a log cabin. You would have to build another log cabin, or no? No, just that part. No, I think you. I think well, I think you have to use the footprint. That that decision ends up being with the building inspector. He he gets to decide what is ex, an extension of the use. So, but generally, if you build on the same foundation, you're okay. I, but I'm guessing if you tried to build a two-story, he would probably tell them they need a special permit, for that would be extending the use vertically. I don't think it has to be a log cabin, but it probably has to be a single-story structure on that foundation. And you really would have to talk to the building inspector to get his take on that. But generally, I think if you're adding a second floor, that would be considered an extension of the use. Yeah. Certainly, if you try to extend the foundation, it's well known that that would be an extension of the use. So, so it's if a you try to take out that foundation and put a bigger foundation in, 
The other thing they'd have to deal with if they did that is they're within 200 feet of the river. Right. And Conservation Commission would have to get involved. So it's, right. it, it's a, it sounds like it's a complicated property for a private individual to come in and build on. But at the same time, it's relatively, it's $169,000 for four acres is how it's advertised. So it also seems very attractive, like I could see someone coming in with a lot of money and, mm -hmm. you know, and this would be very attractive property. So I would support, um, you know, getting an appraisal and figuring out how we position ourselves to um, have more control over this property in town. So, I mean, I mean, part of it, though, is that ultimately you really need to get real specific about the numbers and what's requested of assessment and all yeah. that other stuff. Because the, the reality is that $25,000 is 1% of our annual non-school budget spending. So, I mean, we there's not... Not a lot of money. Not a lot of money. Yeah. And, and that that percentage is that, that th those just, it doesn't take much to have a real impact on our assessments. As everyone here knows.